No, because we also have care and stick incentives. If you say something really scripted and get them off the phone and get more people through, you get a bonus. If you don't, and your call times are over the average of five minutes, you get a penalty. Then finally, after we script and control, monitor, we outsource. If we go, oh, now that we've just, you know, got this practice, this best practice down pat, we can just parse it off and shove it over to India, can't we? Because that's even cheaper. Yes, and all of that equals decreased cost. Ooh, and that equals increased profits. Thank you very much. We now have made our stakeholders, we use the word stakeholders now because we don't want to make it just seem like it's the shareholders, it's everybody is better off somehow, they're a stakeholder. Our stakeholders over on Wall Street or anywhere else they are, are extremely happy because all they care about is short-term profit. And that, ladies and gentlemen, is traditional best practice in the call center. It is gospel. Yeah? Nice. That's the way they work. I'm saying that is zombification. You are killing your employees. You are making us stupid. You are treating us stupid. And we are becoming stupid. Whether it's call centers or best practice in any large company with a zillion different processes. And think for a second what would happen if we did it with that. If we question, is this really best practice? Are these things really good? I don't know. Let's ask that a few times. Let's say, hmm, what if we took this problem from a different perspective and we weren't cheap? What if we said, huh, there's this whole other field called sales and marketing. Which is, you know, how to acquire, keep, maintain customers. And you've got this massive, massive, massive field of dudes running around there trying to capture your mind shit. They're trying to say, hey, this brand is amazing. This brand is great. Okay. I get that. And they're saying, hmm, pay attention, pay attention to this brand. And I'm saying, okay, so here we have best practices, which is zombification. Here you have this need for mind share. What if we treat things as humans with passion and purpose and not think about the profit so much? What if we reintegrate humanity into best practice? Heaven forbid, because we are humans. What if we say, okay, so all that money you spend on marketing and advertising, trillions, is to get mind share. And what do we actually have when you've got somebody on a call center phone? Five minutes of their undivided attention. One-on-one. -on -one. Wouldn't it be better if we had 10 minutes of a customer's undivided attention? Because you're spending trillions trying to get their undivided attention. You're doing an advertising war that started with radio, that went to television, that went to flyers and brochures and banners and ads on TVs from televisions to, to airplanes to toilets. We've got banner ads, we've got all these kind of ads, and then what do you guys do? You fight against them, right? It's an escalating war of attention and trillions. You get spam filters and TiVos so you can block them all out. You get your attention drifted to washing the dishes instead of watching a TV commercial. You, you get anything you can, and here these people are going, oh my god, I have 10 minutes of somebody's undivided attention, the thing I'm striving and spending trillions for, on the phone, and I'm going to treat them like crap? What if you treated those call center employees with an environment of trust. You gave them a sense of purpose about your company and about who they are and about what they're doing. What if you gave them the freedom to say what they wanted to say? What if they felt happy, for God's sakes, when they were on the phone with your customer? What if you gave them no scripts? Literally, the freedom and sense of purpose to just make that customer happy for as long as it took. Three hours, two hours, I don't care. What if they sat on that call center phone and just did everything humanly possible to make the customer happy. Wouldn't that have a huge impact on the customer? I have heaps of stories, one of them being Amazon DE, and I'll give them to you. Wow, I had a Kindle, I had it in my back pocket. 
before I got the case and it could actually fit in my back pocket. I sat on the Kindle. I broke the screen. I said, shh, there goes 120 bucks. But you know what I said? I said, you know what? Just, just out of kicks, I'm going to call and see if they'll just cover it under warranty. So I call up and I'm like, hey, I've got a broken screen on my Kindle. And the guy goes, it was a German guy. So, but he spoke English. What, what happened to your Kindle? And I said, sat on it. <laughs> in a little sheepish tone. And it was a small pause. And he goes, that's okay, it happens. <laughs> and I was like, no, oh, seriously, real story. And I was like, hmm, really? He's like, yeah, we've gotten that before. And uh, no problem, we're gonna just ship you a brand new one, free. Take it out, stick your broken one in the box, and ship it back, free. And I said, wow, seriously? And he's like, yeah, okay. Cool, I have now told that story for a year to everybody I, that wants to listen because that is a wow experience. That was five, 10 minutes or whatever it took that I didn't count because I was so happy on a call center phone with Amazon that made me not just a loyal customer, but an advocate. I am out here now promoting Amazon DE because of a wow experience on a call center because they trusted that guy at that 30 euro expense just turned into thousands of euros of revenue. Mm -hmm. That guy had the freedom to make a decision on his own without being a zombie or a script telling him what to do. At the same token, Singapore Airlines, seven years ago I had an experience when I called them. High quality airline, what did I get? Call center in India, guy couldn't help me, it took me two hours on the phone with Singapore number that rerouted to India, couldn't do one thing, which was replace my loyalty card. It took me two hours and multiple calls. How did I feel about that? Frustrated and unhappy, and I've given that bad experience over and over for seven years. What was the cost? The real cost, the human cost, the profit cost, the brand cost, the loyalty cost. It was massive. So, no scripts. Increase call time, don't decrease call time. No monitoring and insource it back in because it's the most valuable contact you have left for the customer. All of these things are anti-best practice, but all of them make sense on a human level and on a profit level. But we just can't think of that, can we? Because we're inundated and we're stuck with inertia thinking. I'm not exactly sure I have a slide up here, but I think the point is that happiness spreads. And there was a recent study that I read, kid you not, statistically significant study just came out that happy workplaces show 6% more productivity than unhappy workplaces. And it kind of makes sense, doesn't it? If you're happy, you're kind of motivated. If you're unhappy, you're miserable and you just sit there. So, to wrap this up, I want to leave you with things to do or think about at least. Here's a little checklist that I've got on how to unbrainwash yourselves and not become a sheep. One, grow a pair. <laughs> Seriously, even the girls out there. Grow a pair of balls, get some courage, have some faith to stand up against established best practice. Don't be afraid. You've got to vanish fear from your workplace, from your mentality. Fear holds you back and it prevents you from achieving good things, crushing and challenging status quo. Second, foster culture. And it's easy to say, hard to do, but you need to make culture the most important thing in your company, your startup. Culture is key, because that's what's going to maintain your spirit as you grow large as well. It's going to be the thing that prevents you from becoming a machine in your company, from just becoming another big company. Google was cool, got big, Google is not cool. The story repeats itself over and over because they don't value culture. A little example that's really short about what I mean by that. But my company, Mammoth, we really value culture. I'm, I'm super strong about it. My little, my point of culture, what do I love? I love freedom. I love fun. I love complete and total trust and transparency in the workplace. And I value team over the individual. These are just my little values for Mammoth. But what does that actually translate to? It means that I have to be prepared to hire based on culture. If somebody has a great skill set and I interview them, but they don't fit that culture, I've got to have the strength to say, sorry, we really need a person, we really need a great job developer, but, you know, it, it means I have to promote based on culture, 
not just achievement, whatever that means. It means I have to grow really slowly, because when you grow slowly, that culture can sort of virally infect everybody and cement together. But if you grow really fast, you know, we're only 35 people, we take 10 people on, we can't really integrate those people into our culture, so well, can we? So again, against common thinking, gotta grow, gotta grow, gotta grow. Why? So you can become a machine, I don't know. And it means that we all just have to value the aspect of culture itself, that these things are what make us good. It gives us purpose and meaning, and why we want to wake up, and we want to wake up tomorrow and the next day and keep going to work. Just a little example. It means we've talked about, okay, sorry, we've talked about breaking the rules, you know, growing up here, elevating culture to, to one of the most important things, eradicate fear. Fear has to be gone from the workplace because if you don't have a culture without fear, Nobody's going to ever say something. No one's going to feel good. No one's going to stand up. You're going to have the stick incentive rather than carrot incentive. And it's just, fear doesn't work in the workplace. There's no place for it. You can't have freedom without fear, or with fear, rather. And finally, you've got to embrace humanity. Embrace humanism and stop aspiring to be machines. Lastly, finally and lastly, we got both. I want you guys to ask why after this. In, in every presentation you hear after this, ask why. Why is this guy saying this? Why is it true? You know, examples. Why, why should we have five-year plans? Because of ECS, but I don't know why. Because in five years everything's going to be the same as now? What, what's the point of five-year plan? Like, seriously. No. Why, why should we have individualized commission? We're a salesperson. So all salespeople can compete with each other because nobody else helps me sell. 